الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد قال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد يا أيها الناس عبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون صدق الله العظيم العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وسلم عليه We live in an increasingly complex world a world where advancement and technology has facilitated ease and luxury and even opulence a lifestyle that could never have been envisaged by our forefathers however we are at a stage in human history where whilst physical um, ailments are being investigated and even killed when it comes to um, psychological problems the science of psychology is so underdeveloped that it is just about keeping pace with um, problematic psychology psychology which revolves around problems but where psychology is associated to well-being and leading a productive and optimum life psychology and the province of and the science of psychology offers very little enlightenment in that simply because it is a relatively new science and as with all sciences they are based in trial and error and once there is success in some elements in the context of psychology you are dealing with a complex set of features which science doesn't understand. The only thing science understands is the mind which is based in the brain. <coughs> that mind, if it has cognitive facilities, science gives it a status. If it doesn't have cognitive facilities, Science takes a different view about it. But the Qur'an offers us insight into ourselves as to who we are and how to not only understand ourselves but our goal in life. Because that's really all about well-being. People who have objectives in life seldom become embroiled in problems because they have clearly defined objectives. I always give you this I give this example. If you have a flight to catch, no matter how much someone tries to embroil you in a fight, in the back of your mind you will always have a cut-off point. But beyond this I cannot engage with this person because I have a flight to catch. That's my destination. But the problem is we actually don't have a purpose in our life. And then when problem, problems come, there is no such thing as a problem-free life. Whether they are physical problems, which through the aid of science we have been assisted with, but when psychological problems come, we find it, we engage in what we call in the game of rugby, into a scrum. We get so embroiled in that, that we forget the bigger picture. And what the Qur'an does is it A, talks to us about ourself, <coughs> and B, talks to us as to our purpose. Um, men of wisdom have said, and of course this includes women, that one of your purposes in life is to find your purpose. But the way we have been this designed as human beings in this modern 
post-industrial era, technological era, is we are just machines, <coughs> or operators of machines, and in many respects machines ourselves. We don't have the time to sit back and think <coughs> about the golden questions. Who am I? What am I doing here? Why am I here? And what happens next? We don't have time for these questions. We've got bills to pay. We've got obligations. We've got expectations. We've got liabilities. We've got, we are imprisoned. And wherever we turn, we are faced with more and more regulation. If you look at the law books of today and the law books of 100 years ago, the corpus of law has multiplied times a thousand. Why do you need so much law? Because man, this man is the same man as a human being, is the same human. Why was it that 100 years ago, 200 years ago, as much law was not needed? And why is it today, despite all these educational developments, these enlightenments that human race have in, in, encountered, why is it that there are still, uh, oh, that there are more and more laws? Whenever I um, uh, go to a shop or sit on a plane and someone smiles at me, whether that's a person, member of the personnel or a salesperson, I ask myself, is this smile really uh, for uh, the sake of a smile or for good etiquette or is this because it's part of my job? I have to do it. We have become like machines and we don't know when this button is, when this machine is going to fall. There are people who have very short lives. It's just day after day, day after day, we don't get that opportunity to sit back and think. And the Quran invites us and tells us, look, think about yourself. Think about where you came from. Think about what you're doing here. Think about where you're going. And if you start thinking about that, what that will do is it won't uh, it, it won't dislodge you from your life or your responsibilities, but it will give focus, it will give a sense of direction. Where am I going? Yeah, <clears throat> today I had this problem, tomorrow I've got another problem. And if you look at your history, it's all scattered with different forms of problems. <coughs> but psychological problems are on the rise. And the Prophet ﷺ talked about psychological problems 1400 years ago. He said that a person will pass a grave and he will look at the grave and he will say, ah, if only I was in the grave. As in, as a means to escape from the mental pressure that I'm under. Yet, on the face of it, we, what we have, our forefathers, our forefathers couldn't uh, envisage. Why, was there, why would they be able to sleep peacefully at night with less and with us having more? Why are we the subject of so much mental turmoil? We have to ask these questions. And we have to ask, where have we gone wrong? And it's not about wrong as in fault. It's about what can we do to harmonize ourselves in the way that our forefathers did. Um, so, the problem is, because we have no time for ourselves and our own development, um, then diseases begin to fester within us. And those diseases, as they fester, there's no one there to check and balance us. Um, the NHS is not interested in you until a problem arises. Or, should I say, until an incident arises. The NHS is not interested in you. And if you go to private uh, therapy or private assessment, again, <clears throat> simply dealing with your thought processes is not something which can uh, 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 be dealt with unless you actually physically do something. So the, the, the point I want to make is that we live in a very complex world and these verses that we are about to look at I would like to offer you the opportunity to look at them from a different perspective. Because whenever these verses come about, people say, yeah, 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 yeah. I know they mean, yeah, 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 and they just go, 
if you just stop that yeah, yeah, yeah in your mind and think this is your manufacturer talking to you and he knows you and he knows what you need. And we always accept when you know, speakers and scholars say the Qur'an is the greatest miracle. We say, subhanAllah, but what does that really mean? You know, <clears throat> when something is a miracle, it must have an impact. It can't just be a symbolic miracle. It's got to have an impact. You know, it's, 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 uh, uh, this isn't a symbol, but it's how we engage with it and how we extract from it. And I think I told you this at the beginning, that Hazrat Ibn Abbas once lost the saddle of his horse. He didn't look here, there, everywhere, he looked in the Qur'an. So the Qur'an has within it so much to offer, but it's just our demeanor as, how, as to how we engage with it. Of course, the, the text itself is talking about something, but when we start to focus on it, actually, this is a, 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 a manifesto for our life. So we start off by, remember I told you four lectures ago, every verse you look at, you look at, is it Sharia? Is it Tariqa? Is it Hatika? Is it Ma'rifa? Now the verse that we look at next. So sorry, the verses which we have looked at are psychological diseases. No one is there to rectify, they fester, they reach a stage that it reach, it leads to Kufr, it leads to a, a person People often think that you could be in a state of Iman and be enlightened. No. You could be, and this is the case with the majority of people of Iman, they are in Iman but in darkness. <clears throat> Being Iman itself is a light, but that light necessarily cannot extinguish the other darknesses that you are in unless you realize what those darknesses are. So, the vastness of the different kinds of darknesses is what the Quran talks about. Look, this is a darkness, this is a disease. And Allah talks about nifaq. Because nifaq is the ultimate disease of the heart. <coughs> and once this sets in, but it doesn't set in overnight. No one is born a munafiq. No one is born evil. These things develop over time. They're not checked. So the question is who checks them? Actually, if you happen to have a, a parent who is uh, uh, who is uh, uh, vigilant, a parent will spot a bad habit and say, no, this is wrong, you shouldn't do this. But most parents today, so, uh, today are either intimidated by their children or they're so overwhelmed with their own issues, they don't have time for their children. I'm not being critical, by the way, I'm just saying <coughs> it is how it is. So there's no forum for us to go and say, look, I, I want to be appraised, but where am I, who am I, where am I going? There's no forum for that. So the Qur'an, of course, is the starting point. And the Qur'an talks in the next verse. Ya ayyuhal nas, O people, u'budu rabbakum, worship your Lord, alladhi khalaka kum, he who created you, alladhina min qablikum, and those before you, la'allakum tattaqun, so that you may, uh, oh, how is he translated it, so you may ward off evil. La'allakum no. tattaqun, so that you may be engaged in taqwa. Now, on the face of it, you've heard this verse again and again. Worship Allah, He created you, and be muttaqi. But if you start to now dive into specific words, there's a lot there for you to uh, think about. The, the statement starts off with, this is the manufacturer talking to its product. Look at it like this, you know when a, a phone, now it... Uh, nowadays, you don't need to plug your phone into the computer. Nowadays, the manufacturer sends you a message into your computer and you just update. And as long as you update your phone, you will be bug free, as they say. Mm. This is your manufacturer talking to you. He's created you. Now, look at, look at the sequence. We, 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 I think we looked at this. He created you as the best of creation. The best. <laughs> the absolute best. Better than, better than, better than. Whoever you look at, those who you know better than and those who you don't know better than. And he says this himself, this is not me saying it. Why? لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ التَّقْوِينَ We made you as the best of creation. Your rationale cannot fathom how great you are. I'm not trying to blow up your head and make you feel proud, but this is your manufacturer talking to you. And I'm sorry, you could think that angels have this power, that power, this magnitude.
to travel from one uh, uh, from the one uh, um, from the uh, from the head of the angel to the first part of the um, of the of the uh, wing, seventy thousand years of Earth time. Can you imagine the magnitude of angels? And then they have these angels who have six hundred wings. So you can imagine that the, the, the enormity of this creation. They have immense power. They have knowledge. They have this. Then you have jinns. Then you have other associated creations, uh, uh, like jinns. Then you have hybrids. Then you have animals. And if you stack them up with the human race, I'm sorry, there's no comparison. They are more superior. You know what we call bionic animal kingdom has it in front of you. So on what basis are we the best of creation? Well, this is a question we have to ask. This is not me speaking. This is your manufacturer speaking. You are the best. So you you were the best. You were created the best. Then you were relegated. And I often use this word. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ الْقِيَامِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا. Then you were relegated, like football teams were relegated. You were relegated. أَسْفَلَ الْسَّافِرِ to this mortal body. Now, your task is to get back to that state of protection, uh, perfection. How do you do it? The Quran says, we'll tell you how. But this is uh, uh, the first time Allah directly speaks to the human being in the Quran, on the first occasion of the Quran. Ya ayyuhal nas, O people. Now, at certain juncture, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladina aman, O you who believe, Ya ayyuhal. So there is a specification of which kind of group. But at this juncture, Allah is saying, an nas. An nas means all human beings. And may I also add to this that whilst the word nas is used, humans, this includes jinns. But why wouldn't Allah, because the Quran is for jinns also, but why wouldn't Allah say, Ya ayyuhan nas wal jinn? Oh, humans and jinns. Worship your Lord. No. He says, Ya you nas, O people. Remember I told you in the last occasion, the dominant species takes precedence. So, Azazil was a jinn. Kana min al jinni. Fafasaka an amri labbi. He was a jinn, but he lived amongst angels. So he was classified amongst the superior species. Yeah? Jinn, on the face of it, is immensely powerful. But when Allah refers to the two creation on this in this universe who have what no other creation have, and what is that? It's one word. It's called discretion. No other. Allah offered discretion to the heavens. He offered it to the earth. Yeah, have discretion. They all refused. No, 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 no. We don't want discretion. We will just toe the line as you want it. No ifs, no buts. We will do as we are told. So Allah offered this discretion. And uh, no one took it. And then Allah says, No Quran, Fahamala wal insan. Insan said, Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Bring it on. I'll, I'll take this challenge. So you, in your original form, acceded to a challenge. Yeah, that challenge was all right. Give me discretion. I'll show you. Uh, I can. I will attempt to go back. So on this occasion, I go back to my original state, even though you are relegating me. So on this occasion, I say, "Oh, people, of course, includes James, male, female, all." But then, why doesn't Allah say, "Ya ayyuhaladina amanu"? Doesn't that make sense? Oh, you who believe, worship. Why is he saying, oh, people worship? After all, Adolf Hitler will not be asked whether he performed Hajj or not. <laughs> Stalin will not be asked if he gains a guard or not. Ibada is the province of people of Iman. So why is Allah saying, oh, people believe, uh, worship me? And again, the word Rabbakum. Notice the secret in here. <clears throat> he doesn't say any other word. Ilahukum. Or you say Rabbakum. The one who 
again, this is an incorrect translation. Worship your Lord who had uh, worship your Lord who hath created you. He's not even uh, um, the word Rab doesn't mean Lord. Mola means Lord. Rab means the one who sustains. <coughs> the one who sustained you. So you are being told about the one who has sustained you. And then he's saying to you, O oh product, your goal, worship your Lord. But does that mean simply ritual worship or is there more to it? Now I would like to introduce another verse of the Quran, which, of course, as we know, the best form of tafsir of the Quran is tafsir al Quran bil Quran, where you use one verse to do tafsir of another verse. This, that's the best form of tafsir. And then, of course, the second form of tafsir is tafsir al Quran bil Hadith. So, in another verse which I introduced, would like to introduce you, and that says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We didn't, now, on, in this verse, Allah specified humans and jinns. In this verse, he says, we did not create the human species and the jinns, but for one purpose. This is the start of the conversation. We didn't create them, but for. I mean, what was the real purpose of their creation? إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ So that they could worship. Um, Worship? Is that just uh, an act? A symbol? No. Even worship has a destination. And that is why Hazrat Ibn Abbas radiallahu an comments on this verse and he says, Worship as in you have been created with the view that you worship Allah, i.e., you know Allah to get to know Him. What's the use of worshipping someone if you don't want to know Him? You know, it's like you picking up the phone and having a conversation with someone purely for a, a, a matlab because I need you to do X, Y, or Z but I don't want to have a relationship with you okay, you'll do that once, you'll do that but ultimately, and that's what happens we turn to Allah, there's nothing wrong in turning to Allah in our problems but that's all we do, we keep Allah in that category where we only turn to Him when there's problems but if we engage in a relationship with Him there's a lot more that can be uh, attain. But in this verse, he's saying, rabbakum, Worship your Lord. Now if you bring that verse and mix it with this, Know your Lord. And then if you bring the Hadith, now this is the Shiru Quran with Hadith, the Prophet says, Wa'abud, wa'abud rabbaka, wa'abud, Worship your Lord. And this isn't just limited to ritual worship. The Prophet says, and again look at the word, wa'abud, wa'abud. As if you see him. Even though you cannot see him, it's not that he can't be seen. Even though you cannot see him with these naked eyes at this moment because the uh, necessary protocols are not fulfilled. So you should conduct your life as if he sees you, as if you are having a relationship with him, as if he is with you all the time. Now when you bring those two verses with this verse uh, uh, and mix it with this verse, you can understand Allah saying, oh you who believe, oh, oh people, have a relationship with Allah, worship him, know him, have a relationship with him. That's your, that's your protocol, that's your purpose in life. If you don't want to have a relationship with Allah, then I'm sorry. If you don't want to uh, 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 know him, have a relationship with him, then you will get bored of namaz, ruzah, and zakat. You will get bored of all of this. I'm telling you. Why? Because it's monotonous. You do it again and again and again and time you come to me. Where is this taking me? Where am I going? But when you have a clearly defined goal, I want to know. And you can test this yourself. How much, how close was I to Allah last year and how close to Allah? And if the answer is, I was in exactly the same spot as I was last year to this year, then you ain't going anywhere. Your life is stagnant. But the more you engage in your relationship with Allah, the more you progress, and you see that progress, and you understand, and He engages with you, and He talks to you, but his, the way He talks to you is not the way we talk to each other. 
So you have a thought in your mind and he responds to that thought. And you can ask yourself in many ways how you've asked, you've wanted something and he's given you. And I, I always give this example uh, because it's personal to me. When I was three years old, I loved uh, riding a bike. And my uncle and father said, no way, you're not riding a bike, it's dangerous outside. Have you seen these maniacs, they drive driving? And I remember the first door I did was on, uh, on a bike at three, four years old. And I knew that this was mission impossible. But lo and behold, my uh, uh, uncle came from Holland and he migrated to England temporarily and he bought a bike. And he said, yeah, I didn't need this bike. So I thought, that's okay, that, that, that can't be coincidence. And, and there was no opposition, I had a bike. But the point is, you have to ask yourself, in your life, you've asked a lot of things, and he's given it to you. Yet he may have written something else, but you've asked for it. He's changed what he's written because he wants a relationship with you. Or a lot of them. He wants a relationship. And he says in his autobiography, have you ever heard the terminology used for Allah? Autobiography. Allah talks about himself in, in this hadith. Allah says, Kuntu kanzan makhfiyan fa'ahbabtu an araf. I was a hidden treasure. And I wanted to be known. I wanted to be known. So it means that he wants to be known, he wants to have a relationship. But us, look at us, we're not interested. We're so busy in the dunya. I was saying a share today, uh, to, uh, I was speaking to a scholar on the phone and he said, where are you, you're so busy, you're not, you, know, you don't answer calls. And I said to him, there's a share of Allah Mahabal, where he says, Baghir bahisht se, hukme safar diya tha kyun? from the Garden of Eden. Why did you give me my marching orders? He, he is translating the protest of man to Allah. Well, I was perfectly fine in Eden, in Jannah. I'm busy in the world and I'm waiting for you. That's how we are. We're just so enrolled. But the problem is, there's no harm in being busy in the world. But it's having our priorities right. Being busy is absolutely fine as long as your priorities are in order. And if your priorities are not in order, then no matter how much you do, it will never give you satisfaction. You'll always be performing and performing. What was I saying a few minutes ago? I was making a very point. Let's just see if you're actually following. You're saying Allah Akbar share to set your priorities right? Yeah. So uh, there was another share of Allah. Ah, yeah. So he wants to be known. He says, um, uh, to, uh, Ulfat means love. Ulfat means You couldn't fulfill the expectations of love. I wanted to be known, but you just couldn't meet the challenge. You can step up and, 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 and say, no, I'm going to put everything behind. I want to know who my manufacturer is. You know, I knew, uh, I once knew this uh, child who was adopted and she spent uh, five years of her life looking for her original parents, her biological parents. Why? She wants to know who I am, where I came from. Don't you know, don't you know want to know who your creator is, what he wants from you? He doesn't want you to just put your head on the floor. And it's not that by putting your head on the floor you'll get salvation. There is hadith literature which says that, listen, you can do what you like. That cannot guarantee you salvation. Why does he want us to wake up in the middle of the night? As uh, 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 an Englishman by the name of Bob once said to me, oh, is that the month where you have to wake up in the middle of the night and force yourself to eat? <laughs> That's how he described it. Why does this creator want us to force ourselves to eat in the middle of the night? Why does he inconvenience us and say, get up and now worship me? Why does he do that? Why does he say, stop working and now come to me? There, there is a, 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 a thought process behind this. This is not just do it for the fun of it or a pie in the sky when you die. It's for you, for this life. It's designed for you. But again, I've mentioned this before. When we read Salah, it's like, oh, our mind is all elsewhere. It's, not, it's nothing about having a relationship with Allah. And Allah is saying that. Oh, people have a relationship with me. Ya you are nas, Come to the forum of ibadah. But ibadah is not just formal ibadah. For a moment, every moment in his life, even in his sleep, 
he is performing ibadat. Why? For example, the Prophet says, uh, when the, the one who fasts, he sleeps or she sleeps, even that is ibadat. So, ibadat, don't think ibadat is just one narrow form. Your whole life is based on ibadat. And when you conduct yourself as if he is looking at me, I'm looking at him, not just in salah, then it changes the emphasis of your uh, life. And then your demeanor towards him changes. There was a great Baliya, her name was uh, Sayyida al Rabia Basriya. Uh, she was very uh, hungry one day and she was sat amongst her companions. And they were very hungry also. And they were, <coughs> she had already told them that there's only two pieces of bread, two small pieces of bread. And, um, uh, and, and, and uh, she, um, uh, uh, they, they were all thinking, how oh, am I going to distribute two pieces of bread amongst all these people? I mean, it's just not going to happen. I mean, everyone's literally going to have a little bit. So they're all waiting there, and um, someone knocked the door and said, Give in the way of Allah. And she started smiling, and everyone was going, Oh no. <laughs> what a nine, no, those two have gone. <laughs> so she told them, she said, Give them two loaves of bread. And they were all sat there thinking, That's it, no meal today. Then a few minutes later, someone knocked on the door. Yeah, who is it? Said, there is a gift for you, lady. Dear lady, and say that Rabia Basriya. Yeah, there's a gift for you, your lady. So what's that? Fifteen loaves of bread. And all the people said, so you can imagine the smile on their face. Subhanallah. And what was their reaction? No, 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 this is not for us. Take it away. We don't want this. And they said, are you mad? You had two, and Allah said, you fifteen. And they were devastated. She sent them away. And then they waited and they waited. All right, well, we're not going to get fed today, so let's just pack our bags. That's a packing that bag. <coughs> Someone knocked on the door. Yes. Oh, lady, there is a gift for you. So what's that? 20 loaves of bread. She began to smile. She was not come. So one person asked her, said, why didn't you accept the 15? Why did you accept? Is it because of the quantity? She said, no. Allah has said, when you spend in my way, I give you 10 times. According to my calculations, <laughs> Subhanallah. two times <laughs> help me out here. Two times ten is not fifteen. <laughs> yeah. So when I had fifteen, I knew this is not from Allah. But when I had twenty, I knew this is from Allah. So uh, this is how the, 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 the people of Allah uh, uh, were. Look at those people who engaged in a relationship with Allah. Who were those people? Ambiya and Awliya. Their lifestyles are based on a, a, a relationship with Allah and how they have that relationship with Allah. Um, the one who uh, uh, created you. Uh, and this creation is not just your physical creation, as in your, you know, the, the creation, where you were the creation. Um, في أحسن التقويم the best of the best والذين من قبلكم الذين before you لعلكم تتقون and again here the emphasis is what is taqwa it's a really and here look uh, uh, so you may ward off evil that's just one dimension of taqwa but if you look at wherever taqwa is mentioned in the Quran wherever taqwa is mentioned in the Quran you will see it refers to have a relationship with Allah have a relationship with Allah so taqwa or uh, this translation, which you will find in many uh, books, God fearing, so, taqwa is God consciousness. That what I am doing, what I am saying, Allah says in the Quran, when three of you speak, you must know there is a fourth in that conversation. Who is that? Allah. When four of you speak, then you must know there is a fifth in that conversation. But do we do that? No, we don't. When we start our conversation, whether it's on the keyboard or whether it's on you know, the telephone or well, we there are no breaks but there is a fool and there is another one listening and he says <laughs> only for a relationship so that relationship is not in this uh, not in the akhirah of course those who have a relationship with him in this dunya will have one in the akhirah <laughs> it's about on the day of judgment the prophet says when prophets will be trembling, nafsi, 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 
that on that day, loud voices will be talking to Allah. Loud, in, sh in shouting terms. And then we say, who dares talk to Allah on this day in such a manner? And then we said, these are the children, this is Bukhari, this is, these are the children who were uh, destined for life on this earth, they died before puberty. And their destination is Jannah. But they will argue with Allah on the Day of Judgment and say, we refuse to go to Jannah without our parents. Ajib. How can someone raise their voice in front of Allah? This is a form of love. Like Musa Islam, and he used to raise his voice. It wasn't in anger for the light, it was, it, was, it, it, it was a form of love. So sometimes raising the voice it has that impact. So uh, 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 Allah does, does not rebuke them for raising the voice, but that, that's what love is. So, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the Prophet was approached by a companion, and uh, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I made a terrible mistake. I, in the state of Jahiliya, I buried my daughter alive. And she was calling me, Oh, Father, don't bury me, don't bury me. And I was burying her because I was in darkness. I couldn't see. All I was subsumed with was the culture I was brought in. Unfortunately, we have the same problem that we are sometimes so subsumed in our culture that we forget what Dean is telling us. So he said, I was so subsumed that I didn't give credence to what she was saying. Now that I've accepted Islam, I really regret what I've done. Is it possible that you can bring her back to life? The Prophet didn't say, Oh no, this is shit, you can't ask me, you have to ask her like this. What are you doing here? No. He said, Fine, let's go to the grave of the, your daughter. He said, Let's go to the grave of your daughter. And he went to the grave of his daughter and he spoke to that daughter who had died in her grave and he says, Oh girl, your father has come to Islam, he has repented, and he now wishes for you to rejoin him. Is this something you want? He's asking <laughs> this girl in her grave. Is this something you want? He's giving her discretion. She responds, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I pleaded with my father, do not do this. I pleaded in the name of my love. It was all about love. I pleaded in the name of my love to my father. But he was so blind and dumb, he could not uh, hear or see my love. And so then when he buried me in the darkness of the grave, I encountered the love of Allah. Now Allah has given me so much love, I don't think I want to leave that love for this love. That superior love to this love. So, no, thank you. So the Prophet said to the Sahabi, sorry, she didn't want to come. Why? Because the love. So Allah is a, you see the problem is scholars have portrayed Allah as this, as this, I so, I'm sorry to use this word, as this monster, as this punisher, as this knows Billah, as this tyrant. No, Allah is kind, he's loving. And he says, uh, my, um, my, my mercy, prevails over my anger. But the scholars have, certain scholars, or majority scholars, have portrayed Allah as this, as this, as this, knows Billah, knows Billah, tyrant. But Allah, at every juncture of the Quran, invites us to love, to have a relationship. And this is what this verse is about. Oh, come, have a relationship with me. So that your life can be dominated with things. And bear in mind, he uses the same when we are fasting. You know that verse? He says, Ya amanu kutiba alaykum Oh, you believe uh, we gave you, we prescribed for you Rosa? Kama kutiba alaykum So that you can be. So, what's the significance of la'allakum tattakun there and here? You see, when we deprive our body of food, that deprivation allows us to come close to nature again. And that proximity, okay, in the first few days our blood sugar levels may be high and low. But generally, when we, a person who fasts, he's much closer to nature. And the propensity towards taqwa is greater. I'm not suggesting that you fast or you diet necessarily. What I'm saying is that Allah has given us different prescriptions. 
in different parts of the Quran so that he can facilitate the Quran. What is the objective of the Quran? A relationship with Allah. And then he says, look at this. I mean, if you, think, if you read this with the eyes and glasses of love, you'll get a different picture of it. It's like some, this guy came to me one day, very arrogant person. He said, oh, you say the Prophet so that uh, uh, can give you something. He can't, give any, he can't even give you any, uh, 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 guidance. And all the people around me, they were going to bust him. And they were going to really knock him out. <coughs> and he said, no, 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 I'm quoting the Quran. And I says, inna kala tahdi man ahbabta. The Quran says, oh, my beloved, you cannot guide the one who you like. Wallahu yahdi mahiyash. Allah guides you. Allah likes and he says, see, and I say, the Prophet said, that's can't guide. And you think he can give you this, he can give you that. He can. I said to him, I said, listen, just take your glasses off of your head. He said, what do you mean? I said, just put another frame on your, uh, on your eyes and just think, read this verse with another perspective. He said, what? It means you can't guide them. Look at this. This is, there is so much piyar in this verse. Oh, my beloved. You cannot guide who you like. Why? If I left the decision of guidance in your hand, you are Rahmatullah I mean, you would make sure no one ever went to jail. <laughs> yeah, you would make sure no one, you do your job. But the decision of Hidayah is mine. Why? Because that's my purpose. But if I left this to you, even the one who's a, you know, you, there's two grades, isn't there? Certified and chartered. And even in Jannah, you are two grades. Certified Jannah, and the Chartered Jannah. The one who is a Chartered Jannah, whose Jannah is advertised in the Quran. Even him, the Prophet said, is working on him. Maybe Allah will give him guidance. Maybe I can save him from the fire of hell. Allah, the Prophet didn't say, wow, wow you, you're finished. The verse of the Quran, you're, you're a no-go as we think. You're a no-go now. Despite being a no-go, the Prophet and then the greatest of Munaf, the king of Munafiqeen, Abdullah ibn Ubayy, when he died, the, one of the greatest enemies of the Prophet look how soft his heart was. His son, who is a Sahabi, Ya Rasulullah, could you attend my father's grave for uh, uh, dua? He didn't say, no, no, he's a Munafiq, he's going to see. The Quran talks about Munafiqeen and their fate, but the Prophet said, it's fine, no, no. that's what he called Rahmatullah. In fact, the Prophet said, he even said, Ya Rasulullah, give him your kurta. Because he, they believed in Tabarruk. They didn't say, no, 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 this Tabarruk is shit. They said, give him your kurta. Why? Because your kurta could be a source of masila for him. Anyway, so uh, when the Prophet went to his grave, he did dua and he stood by his grave. And Allah said, he revealed a verse in the Quran. La tusalli ala ahadin minhum mata abadan. Beloved, don't ever stand by their graves. Don't ever pray at their graves. Don't stand at their graves. Why? Because I know you are not going to want anyone from the human race or the jinns to go to Jahannam. But you do your job and you leave the rest to Allah. So if you look at this verse from the perspective of Allah, Allah is saying, Come and have a relationship with me. I created you. I created you. Come and have a relationship with me. And those who, who, who are before you. And then he says, And here's the, the piyar. This earth was not made for donkeys, horses, animals, <coughs> insects. It was not made for angels. It was not made for everyone. He says, this earth made was, was made for you. You know, like a parent says to his child, you know, whatever I've got, it's yours. There's God in that, isn't it? Look here, whatever I've got is yours. Now, of course, whatever Allah has is not limited to the heavens and the earth. But look at the, 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 the love in this. Says, whatever I have, come have a relationship with me. Whatever I have is yours. He made for you the earth, Firashan, a bed, for you to rest on, for you to conduct yourself on. And remember the, 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 this uh, dialogue, because this is coming later on, in the verses, uh, uh, um, yeah, in verse number 29. 
It is he who created everything on this earth for you. That spider who's crawling, you can't see the connection between that crawling and you. But ultimately, whatever you see in the ecosystem is created for you. You know the ecosystem, we can't relate it back to us. How does an ant eating in its burrow have benefit us? No, there's a system in place. The whole ecosystem, the whole system in this world is created for you. He made it for you. Look at the love in this verse. Come to, look at the context. Come and have a relationship. I made this all for you. Uh, and the uh, skies are made as a canopy for you. I, to protect you from the rays. This is all for you. I made it for you. Look at the, the tone, the dialogue. And then he says, وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا And then from the heavens, this is Allah's, uh, uh, um, uh, what is it called? The system of water. Um, um, we regulate water to purify it. And Allah says, listen, I have created the system of giving you clean, fresh water, because water is the source of life, as the Quran says. وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ رِزْقًا لَكُمْ All of this garden, this, these fruits, this water, it's all for you. It's not for the animals. It wasn't created for the animals. These animals were created for you. That ecosystem, ultimately everything was created for you. I once read when I was very young, a, a, an experiment which the Chinese government did, where they decided that they were going to kill clinically kill all the flies in a certain village in the thought that this would be a, 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 a step towards a hygienic uh, environment but they found that the infection rate in that village <laughs> enhanced times 10 they couldn't understand, they couldn't see the correlationship but the Prophet said 1400 years ago said, so you may not be able to see uh, the reality of a fly in fact, I think I mentioned this at least. When a fly falls into your food or into your uh, 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 thing, don't d destroy that food. Dip it. As a, by default, a fly will always fall on its left wing. The hadith, the Prophet says, a fly will always fall on its left wing. But don't d uh, um, dispose of that food. Why? Dip the right wing in the food or water and then drink or consume. Why would you want to dip a fly in your food? Today, science has realized that the secretion from the right wing of a fly is of an antiseptic nature and destroys the harmful effects of the left secretion of the left. This is so. Ultimately, there. Why would, and, and the, there were, are those uh, uh, species on this earth that have such high levels of utility for the human race that they will be rewarded by virtue of that utility in Jannah. So the bee will go to Jannah. Why? Because the most potent form of khidmah which the insect kingdom offers to the human race is honey. So therefore, uh, look at the context of this. For you all. And then Allah says, what do I want in return? فَلَهَا تَجْعَلُوا إِلَّهِ Sorry. فَلَهَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُوا Just turn your shirk. I've done everything for you. you know, just, don't, just don't betray me. Don't think that there is a, 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 a monkey and you know, this is your God. Don't think that there's an elephant and this is your God. Don't look at fire and say this is your God. Just, just, just don't betray me. I am one, and just keep firm with me. Then the he, uh, 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 the tone now. So uh, I didn't explain this in the uh, beginning. Yeah, he would ask when Allah talks. He doesn't talk to just people of Iman here. He talks to Muslims and non-Muslims. So there are different categories of nas, and it's nice to know the different categories of nas. So in the first category is of course people of Iman, then you have people uh, the Kafir, those who reject Iman, then you have the Dahriya, the Dahriya are those who are atheists, they have no faith. Then you have uh, uh, those who are Zindiq, 
uh, I'm sorry, munafiq. Munafiq are those who have no faith on the inside and a facade of faith on the outside. Then you have those who are zindiq, who have faith on the outside, but their beliefs are such heretical beliefs that they are, their iman is very suspicious. So Allah is talking to all of them. And whenever each category is talked of, so for example, what? Ya ayyuhannas, Oh, non-believers, worship your Lord. That means, O oh, non-believers, O oh, kuffar, come to the way of Islam and worship your Lord. When it talks to munafiqeen, it says, O oh, munafiqeen, uh, uh, leave your nifaq and come to your Lord and worship. How relationship? Look at the universality of Allah's uh, uh, invitation. Despite the disease of kufr, despite the disease of nifaq, despite the disease of uh, being zindiq, Allah says no. The invitation is still there. I've not given up on you. I will not give up. Even, come, oh people, come, ha, have a relationship with me. But, of course, if you are not in Islam and you come and have a relationship with me, then I will, I will show you the way uh, 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 towards me. Then Allah says, now listen, I've given you these verses for your guidance. If you have any doubt in your mind about what we reveal to our servant, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِي Now this is, uh, you know, uh, when a product is guaranteed. Uh, we hereby, the, the manufacturer said, we hereby guarantee that you will, you know, there's a guarantee, so whatever the guarantee is, Allah says, listen, this Qur'an is guaranteed in many ways. There are many tiers of guarantee here. But on this occasion, Allah says, if you can replicate it, forget replicating the whole, just one surah, replicate it. And bring your witnesses in Kuntum Salami if you are truthful. 1400 years have passed, you will not find a verse that has been uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, replicated. By someone, many attempts have been made. You know, di different Qurans have been uh, concocted in history, but they've not stood the test of time. They've all collapsed in one form or another. I will talk about how there has been a conspiracy to, to try to deviate. But one thing about this Quran, from chapter to chapter, every letter, not even every letter, every uh, 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 meaning associated to every letter has been preserved over 1400 years. That in itself is a miracle. And then Allah says, فَإِلَّمْ And he says, listen, you can try. فَإِلَّمْ تَفَلُوا um, Let's see what Mr. Pickles has translated it as. فَإِلَّمْ تَفَلُوا And if you do not, وَلَمْ تَفَلُوا And you can never do it. That's not simple English. فَإِلَّمْ تَفَلُوا And if you try to do, فَإِلَّمْ تَفَلُوا If you try to, replicate or bring something similar. You can't do it. But bear in mind you are challenging Allah. Even when you when, when this word is used in the Arabic language, ittaqullah, it means fear of Allah in that in the sense that you're doing something wrong. So Allah says it uh, then fear the fire. Allah and hijara and we have made that fire for humans and stones. Now at this juncture, I'm going to ask a very, not controversial question, but a very logical uh, question here. Humans will do wrong and they will go to Jannah. Easy. But what about these stones? Why will they do wrong? What did they do wrong? The Quran talks about stones. That stones will go to Jannah. Uiddat lil kafirin. We prepared Jannah for them. Why would stones go to Jannah? The, all these statues that were worshipped will go to Jannah. In fact, on the Day of Judgment, Allah will ask those murtis, those statues, Antum adlantum ibadi. Did you misguide my servants into prostrating you? Antum surah furqan. Antum adlantum ibadi. How would I? Or did they lose their own way? And the stones will respond. They will say, Subhanak. Geology hasn't reached that stage where it can understand that stones can communicate. But the Quran talks about the communication of stones. You know, when we say the Prophet was walking past and the stones said to him, 
Wassalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. They say, oh no, the hadith is not strong. But, <coughs> here in the Quran, Allah is saying, the, the statues on the Day of Judgment, they will have a conversation with Allah. And they will say, when Allah will say, did you misguide my uh, servant? Oh no, subhanak. Oh Allah, subhanallah. We didn't misguide them. Ma kana yambadhi lana. And then they have a proper con and then Walakin Matatum wa Abaum Hatta Nasu Zikra wa Kanu Omamura. They will present their case. They will tell Allah about those people who prostrated them and their ancestors. So stones have a much greater lifespan than uh, uh, humans. So they will say, You they did this and their ancestors did this. So then the question that begs to be asked is why would they go to hell? Why would they go to hell? It's not the stone's fault that you were worshipped. Why would he go to hell? I don't know whether I should give you that answer or not. There's a verse of La Tazilu Vazir the Mizrahokra. No soul will bear the weight of another. So they were were shipped. They didn't. Yeah. The, there were occasions where uh, stones used to respond to uh, the mushakim, but those stones that responded, it wasn't them that responded. It, were, it was. <coughs> I was about to, It were. It was uh, Jinnat who used to come in them and use those stones as a modus of communication. One day the Prophet was uh, walking outside of Mecca, the uh, outer area of Mecca, and he saw a person with a sword in his hand and he had blood on that sword. And uh, the Prophet said, who are you, what is this? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I am a jinn. I am a jinn and I am your ummati. And this blood on this sword is the blood of another jinn. That jinn used to come into one of the statues and talk to the mushrikeen. And the mushrikeen used to say, see how God talks? Yeah? So the Prophet had challenged them, okay, I will talk to your uh, 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 so-called God and let's see if he responds. So before that jinn could even come in that stone, before the Prophet could even arrive, one of his uh, uh, ummatis, that jinn, had slaughtered him. Although the question that begs to be asked is, how is it possible that when you kill a jinn, they, they, you, it would have blood because jinns are made of metaphysical uh, matter? How would blood come about? We'll talk about that when we talk about jinns in a bit more detail. But I am the uh, uh, I am your ummah, and I have killed that jinn who used to come in that statue. So you can't blame the stones. You see the point I'm trying to make. You can't blame the stones. So why would they go to hell? I don't know whether I should give you this answer. Is, Any is suggestions? It, is, it, is it to symbolize to the mushrik that, you know, this is your God, you, you were worshipping, and look, he's, in the same, he's got the same fate as you and Jehovah? Yeah, your answer is entirely correct. It is to symbolize. But if I allow me to use your question against you, so tomorrow there's a group of people who start worshipping OS. So then you would go to hell to symbolize. To be, would you like, would, do you think that's fair? Of course it's not fair. Of course it's not fair. But at the same time, I can be an individual who can revoke that, whereas the stone can't. Yes. But are you suggesting that because the stone was incapable of expressing itself, it should be held liable? Unless a stone should talk and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, not me, not me. No? The liability only arises if the stone had the ability to talk. The stone didn't have the ability to talk. The Prophet said, Abu Jahl said, if you, if you are the truthful messenger, tell me what's in my hand. The Prophet knew what was in his hand. He said, why should I tell you what is in your hand? What about if what is in your hand tells you who I am? And he had pebbles in his hand. 
And those pebbles began to say, Shall we lie in our hand and our shadow and our mothers? This is stone talking. Yeah, I'm not trying to take you back in the stone age. <laughs> but I'm saying that stones are a living phenomena. They are living, everything around us is living. We just don't appreciate the nature of that. That's why I have a cop on with vegetarians. I say they are uh, they discriminate. Oh, we don't like to kill animals. I say, well, you kill plants. Murder is murder. Just because you, you understand the nature of and intricacy of the life of an animal, you give, no, oh, no, 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 we don't kill animals, but plants. Now, as science is developing, uh, science is realizing plants have behaviors, plants have a, a life a, 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 a style, they have a life. So, just because I understand one form of life, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to respect that. And, and, and because I don't understand another form of life, I'm not going to respect that. That's ridiculous. I'm not talking about vegan, I mean, that's 10 steps <laughs> down the gutter, but I'm talking about vegetarians. So, what was I saying? What was the question? Should you tell us the answer why will stones go to, why will stones go to Jahannam? Yes. Well, I was saying, well, symbolically. But if I wasn't that stone, I would say, whoa, 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 whoa symbolically, all right, okay, well, well, fine, they did it, but why me? La taziru vazirata vizirafa, the Quran says, no soul will bear the weight of another. Why would those stones go to Jahannam? Is that specific to certain stones or is that generic? Is that generic statement? Well, no, of course it's certain stone. You know, the, the Murtis of, you can imagine, Ram, Sita, or you know, the Elephant King or the Monkey King, they're all going to be there. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we have sneak previews on this earth. <laughs> so, tell me, tell me why. What, ultimately, it's the stone, isn't it? It's the stone. No. The reason why I want to, uh, to, to, to not uh, interrogate you, the reason why I want to uh, 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 think, because the actual answer is in this verse itself. So I hope that when you start thinking, sometimes when you think, the answer can be right in front of you. Because the manufacturer doesn't leave uh, 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 anything hidden. If you inquire, the answer is there. He says, it was created for Jahannam was created for who? The Kafir. Stones on Kafir. So then going to Jahannam will not, it will, you are correct. It will be a symbol for them. But just because they're going to be in Jahannam doesn't mean they will be the subject of punishment. As stones. Yeah? For example, the Prophet Sallallahu visited Jahannam. Does that mean that if he went to Jahannam, he was punished in Jahannam. The Prophet ﷺ visited Jahannam, saw what's there, but was exempted from the, uh, 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 um, the, 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 the pains and pangs of Jahannam. Why? And likewise, uh, 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 stones will go to Jahannam, but they'll be unaffected. But you are correct in saying their presence in Jahannam, their presence in Jahannam, will be a symbol for that. Look, who these you, you used to prostrate them there in Jahannam. Where are they going to help you now? So your answer is on the right lines, but we must understand Allah is a just Lord. He doesn't punish a stone where it's not the fault of the stone. Or in, so the answer is, or in the lil kafirin. It was created for the kafirin. Lil kafirin. That is why I was saying in my speech in Holland last weekend, even if you have a mustard seed of Iman in you, if you go to Jahannam, you will ultimately go to Jahannam. There, or in, the only uh, permanent residents of Jahannam are people who have no Iman. But even if you have a speck of Iman, it will take you to Jahannam. In fact, the Prophet even told us about the last person who will go from Jahannam to Jannah. Have I mentioned that? The La. Have I mentioned that? The last person. Everyone would have migrated. Oh, there will be a migration and it will be written on their passports that he was a Jannah. But you have uh, PR. Um, leave to remain in Jannah. <laughs> but the last person, he will be on the border of Jannah and Jannah. It's very funny because there is a border. Oh, yeah, and there is border control. And there are border guards. Oh yes. So there is a border 
between Jannah and Jahannam. So he will be the last Allah, the Prophet doesn't mention his name. He will be the last person. So he will do dua to Allah and he will say, Oh Allah, I am worthy of Jahannam on account of what I did, blah blah blah. But I am at the border of Jannah. At least turn my face towards Jannah. Wow. Fine, you're going to keep me in Jannah, but at least what does that tell you? People in Jahannam will do dua. And then Allah will accept his dua. So dua is something that will be done even in Jahannam. So Allah will accept his dua. And Allah will say to the angels, turn his face towards. So when he will look at Jannah, he won't experience it. Just by looking at it, he will get a sense of pleasure. After a little while, Allah, he will do dua again. Oh Allah, you've turned my face towards Jannah. At least let me go on the border between Jannah and Jannah. At least let me go right on that border. Allah will say, fine. A angel is taking to right at the border, at the pinnacle, between where the line divided, the divides between Jannah and Jannah. And, uh, or, or is it the other way around? He will say, at least take me towards the uh, uh, line, and, and then he will be taken towards the line, and then he will say, at least let me turn my face towards it. It doesn't matter whichever sequence it is. What is significant is that he will do dua and Allah will accept his dua. In the end, he will be at the border of Jahannam uh, Jahann and Jannah. He will be looking towards Jahannam uh, Jahann and then he will do a final dua. And this is the, and I use this word carefully, the funny part of it. He will do dua and he will say, Oh Allah, I'm at the border, I'm looking at Jannah, let me just go in. <laughs> and then Allah says, in the, the Prophet of the Sunnah, Allah will smile, will laugh according to his majesty. Allah laughs. Allah has a sense of humor. We, as I said to you in the beginning, we have turned Allah into this Nozbillah tyrant who is angry and wrathful and this. No. Allah laughs according to his majesty. Not the way we laugh. We can't compare ourselves with Allah. According to according to his shah, he will laugh and he will say, oh angels, take him into Jannah. <laughs> That's the last person. So even if there is a speckle of uh, iman, Ultimately, then, but if you are certified as a kafir, then there is no uh, uh, migration from that. And give good news to the people of Iman, and, they, and those who do good deeds. Remember this, remember that verse I read in the beginning? Uh, he relegated you, created you in perfection, then relegated you. Then, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَةِ You want to go back to that state of perfection? Iman and Amle Salih. And then Allah says, yeah, come. Iman and Amle Salih, give good news to those people who established these in this dunya. Why? أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْعَارِ For them will be a uh, paradise under which uh, um, rivers will flow. كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَةٍ رِزْقًا they will be given a risk of all variant forms. And then uh, when they see certain fruits, like for example the pomegranate, the pomegranate is uh, one of the fruits of Jannah anyway, but they will see certain fruits which were identical. I'm going to say something here. This is about psychology. Qalu, they will say, Qalu, hadha ladhi ruzikna min qabal. We stand it before. Why now? So firstly, they will be offered fruits. And of course, fruits of different color. Today, psychologists have realized that color attracts us to food in a way that we don't realize. Why, why are these chains like McDonald's and, you know, what well, Wimpy's gone? Uh, what, King, uh, what is it? Um, Burger King, what, you, what, is, what is that color? It's all about color. Enticing. If you go to the shop, they present that, you know, they put so much light on the burger that you look at it and say, I want it, it's a colour. Colour attracts, and it's a psychological trick that's played in, uh, by uh, uh, sales, where they, you know, where they, whereas I can tell you that there is a chip shop in Coventry which has the most atrocious signboard on top of it, and you walk inside and you want to, you know, you want to walk outside. But the chips are fantastic. <laughs> so there you are. And I can tell you chip shops where, uh, I'm not a regular chippy by the way, but I can tell you chip shops where they're beautifully decorated, 
but the food is absolutely disgusting and appalling. They prey on the eyes of the uh, eater and here and uh, presents different fruits, different colors, you know, apples, oranges, these, these different, this is a psychology to attract towards them. But these people, so what this verse tells us, we call this Ishara Turnas. There's an Ishara in this verse. They will say, Hada Nadi Ruzikna Min We used to have this before. So that means the memory will be retained. The memory won't go of what happened on the earth. They will say, We will have this before. They will be told by the angels. Uh, no, sorry, I think I missed a bit. Uh, they will be told, no, no, this fruit looks mutashabia. It is tashmi of what you have, but taste it. The taste is totally different. The taste is different. So, let me say one or two things about Jannah. We eat now, we excrete. Whatever you eat, you could have the most expensive food, it's still going to end up in the same place. It doesn't matter what you eat. It's going to end up in the same place. But in Jannah, there's a hadith. And different Mufasirin have brought this hadith. When you eat, you will perspire, sweat. And through that sweat, that food will depart from your body. Today, science has progressed and realized that what is the content of our sweat? Fat. Hmm? Fat. And? You're very polite, fat. There's something else. Water. Huh? Water. Oh yes, water. But which kind of water? What's that water called? Salty. Again, you're being very polite. <laughs> it's called urea. Don't take my word for it, it's urea. It's urea. So, science has understood and that urea is the body filtering those toxins through sweat. So people who sweat are generally healthy people. People who don't sweat, there is long-term issues for them, but sweating is a healthy uh, uh, phenomenon. So science accepts that you can secrete uh, from your body toxins through sweating. And the Prophet said, 14 years ago says, there will be no excretion in Jannah. You will eat and it will, be, it will leave you, depart your body and whereas sweat in this world, more or less, depending on who we're talking about, has a smell. Yes. No, it's true. Some people have a great smell. It's not to, and it's also associated to food. What food we eat that has an impact. And there are other factors also. There is another factor of sweat uh, that is related to iman. That a, a kafir can bathe five times a day, but he will have, or she will have, an odor on his body, a smell. A stink. But a mu'min, sometimes you will see there are certain mu'mins who walk this earth, their sweat had so much fragrance in it. And when I refer to uh, such people, I refer to many awliya were known that when they used to perspire, they used to be sent associated uh, uh, to them. So uh, there will be no excretion, there will be no, uh, uh, um, uh, there, there, will, there will be no. Uh, illegitimate desire in Jahannam, it will, there will be a purity in everything. Everything will be recycled. Nothing will die. Nothing will perish. That's one of the features of uh, this. This body that we have, the, the reason why it perishes on this earth is because it wasn't designed for this earth. The same body, you take it to Jannah, and it thrives. It becomes immortal. In fact, the body that will go to Jannah will be far more bionic than this body. But this body is the subject of the law of woman. When you age, it goes more and more defective. And now here, the verse continues. Uh, In there, there will be pure spouses. Why pure? Because impurity is a phenomena of the earth and its inhabitants. Whether that's impurity associated to uh, menstruation, whether that's impurity associated to not having wudu, or sec uh, secretion, excretion, whatever impurity, 
none of those impurities will exist. As Bajum Mutahar. They will be pure. And that's why a person will have uh, 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 the ability to. Uh, so if a woman had uh, uh, several husbands on this earth, when she dies, her nikah will break with the last hus husband. Hukuman it will break. Hakikatan the nikah will still be there. Um, so there is a, 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 an issue with some scholars who say when a woman, a husband dies, a woman cannot see the faith because he's no longer in her nikah. But the ahnaf and generally the ulama, they say no, she can see his face because the nikah is hukman, it's broken, but hakikatan the nikah is there. So when she, if she gets to Jannah, then she'll be asked, right, who do you want? Him, him, or him? <coughs> yeah. And the discretion will be hers, and she will make the choice based on. Please note this, because this may be useful for your choices in this world. Not based on hits on uh, Instagram or based on likes in, on Facebook. I don't know whether I'm going the other way around here. But uh, uh, not based on uh, designer wear, not based on uh, 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 makeup. Oh, yes, men do makeup also, absolutely. It's not based on uh, the size of the bank balance. It's not based on... What is it based on? What will women in their state of perfection choose men? What basis will they choose them upon? What is the criteria? And if women realize that they are going to make that decision there, well, they may as well make that decision here and not go for them for frivolous purposes. And that's why they say, I don't know, I'm not... I was in love with him, but I'm not in love with him anymore. It just withers away. But what is the criteria of the marriage? Oh yes, there will be marriage. It ain't going to just be a, 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 a non-marriage. There will be marriage. There is a Sharia in Jannah. Uh, so what were the criteria? Anyone? Iman. Strength. But I mean, if they didn't have Iman, they wouldn't be there. The strength, the strength of Iman. Must be a bit discriminatory, isn't it? Strength of. Come on. Well, I'm not telling you. This is not my view. This is the hadith. The Prophet says the women of Jannah will select which husband to go for based on the one who had the best manners. <laughs> best manners. So the one, not the most intelligent, not the most knowledgeable, not the most uh, uh, wealthy, not the most good looking one based on manners. If only we looked at that today, manners. And manners do not come into the equation. It's all about does he walk the walk or does he talk the talk. And if he, as long as he does that, he's the one. And if he doesn't do that, sorry. So manners, good manners. أَزْوَاجُ مُتَّهَرُ And in there, in there they will be there forever. Any questions so far? Because the next set of verses now Stop to talk about uh, um, something else, and I don't want to embark upon that. Any questions? You, you spoke about you know the relegation of human, um, you know the story of Adam al Islam. The, there's a question that always comes up: is we always taught that prophets are masumun al khata. So how do we reconcile that with the story of Adam al Islam? No, Adam al Islam and prophets weren't relegated. The, Prophets are not the subject of asfalu safilin. They retain their property of being ahsal al-taqmeen, the best of creation. They never are relegated. However, Adam and Islam coming from uh, uh, Jannah here, that wasn't a relegation because of anything that he had done wrong. That was part of Allah's design. Allah had designed that the history of the human race must start in Jannah. Or you, you must know that your roots, your geographical roots are in Jannah. We are the aliens on this earth. Humans are not indigenous population of this earth. We are the aliens who have been made in this earth. You know, we look for aliens. Just look in the mirror. <laughs> we are the aliens. We are not from this planet. That's why this planet is not muafiq to us. It doesn't, it's not hospitable to us. We go in the heat, it burns us. We go in the cold, it freezes us. It's not hospitable to us. 
So Allah's design was this. So he uh, allowed Adam السلام, to be part of that process. When a prophet is part of a process which we consider sin, we cannot say that that is a sin. For example, murder is a sin, is it not? But Musa السلام, murdered a, uh, an Egyptian. What should I say, a, a gypsy? He murdered a, an Egyptian. He murdered an Egyptian. Now, in our law, the rule of murder is. Musa السلام, was not culpable for his actions in Sharia. Why? Because the prophets have a different Sharia to us. Their Sharia is not the same as us. Otherwise, we received the order for namaz after the night of Miraj, right? So what namaz were the prophets reading in Masjid Al-Aqsa? What namaz were they reading? When the Prophet ﷺ used to go to uh, the uh, mountains and he used to worship Allah, under what sharia was he doing that? So everything is regulated under one sharia or not. Sometimes a sharia is based on physical sharia, as in physical prophet, where the prophet comes physically, as long as he's there, after the announcement of his prophethood, his prophethood remains. When he passes away into his grave, his uh, prophet comes to an end. Sometimes a prophet comes, he remains physically there, but his prophet comes to an end. For example, come on, that's not a trick question. For example, a prophet is alive, but his prophethood is no longer operative. Isa is He's alive, but his prophethood is not operative. Then you have the Prophet ﷺ, who was a prophet even before the advent of the human race. But his prophethood was not contingent upon his physical being. It was a, a, a operative through, not Ruhi Muhammadi, but his prophethood was operative through Nure Muhammadi ﷺ. And likewise, at this moment he is in Barzakh, but his prophethood is still operative. So prophethood is not contingent upon physicality. The prophets have their own sharia. We cannot weigh a prophet based on our sharia. So for example, Adam alayhi salam says, Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa alhamna and lanakunanna min al-khasirin. We will be from the people of khasara. If we say that Adam alayhi salam is from the people of khasara, that's kufr. Why? That's ihanat of a prophet. If they say something for their own humility, that's their matter with Allah. Oh, inni kuntu min zalimin. We can't say that they were. Likewise, Musa salam asked for forgiveness from Allah. Qala rabbi inni zalamtu li nafsi. Oh Allah, I've done zulam on my nafs. Faghfir li, forgive me. And then Allah says, faghfir Allah. And we forgave him. There was no compensation scheme. There was no kisas. Allah, faghfir Allah. And we forgave him. The Sharia of Prophets are different. They are Ma'asum and Al Khata. In our Sharia, they cannot commit an error. Their Sharia is different and they will be judged based on their Sharia. So, Adam alayhi salam's kalma is not la ilaha illallah, Adam Safiullah. Adam alayhi salam, his kalma for himself is la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. But Adam alayhi salam's ummah, his kalma is la ilaha illallah, Adam Safiullah. Nuh alayhi salam's ummah, their kalima is la ilaha illallah, nuh najiullah. But Nuh alayhi salam's own kalima is not la ilaha illallah, nuh najiullah. His kalima is la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has a title which is called Imam al-Anbiya. He is the Imam of all the Prophets. He is the Prophet of Prophets. And so therefore, uh, uh, their sharia is different. It cannot be weighed with the measures of our sharia. وما علينا إلا البلاغ